I just love being in Germany because people like sit down and it's two, two seconds and everybody is sitting down. Like every other country is like, oh, I'm not, all right not to sit down. I want to do something different. Except for those people. Just get the, kick them out right now. Um, yeah, I, I just started Microsoft a month ago and I was at Mozilla for four years and I'm going to be part of the Project Spartan, which is the new browser that's coming out from Microsoft, which is going to kick ass. And uh, I've been doing JavaScript for a long, long time. I'm still proud of my 2006 book, which was the first one to mention Ajax and explain Ajax, and I had no freaking idea what I was doing. But it was still got three reprints, and people liked it, so that was pretty good. So when I was asked to write here, I was talking about myself, which I do a lot, which gives you space in the train if you keep talking to yourself. People go out of the way. It's really good. Uh, about ES6 and the advancements in JavaScript that we have right now. And I wanted to give a technical talk, and then I realized that Axel Rauschmeier is actually the organizer here, and there's no way I can give a technical talk about ES6 when he's around, because he's the kind of guy that blog posts you read, and I'm like, either he's a genius or I'm an idiot or both. You know, you're just at the end of it, you're like, that's probably clever. I'm going to look at it in a year's time again and see if I really needed it, and then I'm happy about it. So I was talking to other people about ES6 and uh, about the advancements of JavaScript, and there's a big, there's a big change happening right now, because JavaScript is cool, and that's actually the best logo I found for JavaScript. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's everything. Like I came from JavaScript from Perl, you know, and I realized this like I can use JavaScript for everything, and I don't have to be a good developer. I don't have to be an organized developer. I can still do things with JavaScript, and that drives organized developers nuts, especially when you do cool things that look amazing and people give you praise for it. And JavaScript changed so much over the years. When I started, it was Netscape three times, and then we had like document all for Internet Explorer, and I hated Microsoft for that. And that's why I used document layers for Netscape, and I realized it was a shit idea to do that. And then Netscape 6 came out and turned into Firefox, and we had finally standardized stuff for the web, and I fought for that for the last 10, 15 years. And people nowadays are not really appreciating as much as they should to realize how horrible it was for us in the past to do that. And then JavaScript went out and went from the server side with Node.js. I was part of Yahoo back then when the first Node.js stuff was built inside there, which a lot of people don't know. And now we use it for everything. I mean, you can script Photoshop in JavaScript. Illustrator. You can do whatever you do want to do in JavaScript. You probably don't want to do everything in it, but people do, because if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail or a thumb. And it's really easy to discredit something that is so versatile. And PHP had the same problem. PHP was a templating engine that became a programming language. And the, I worked with the, with the guy who wrote PHP, Rasmus, in Yahoo a lot. And he didn't even like it. He said, like, this thing is so confusing by now. Like, but it's great because it empowers people. And the same with JavaScript. It makes you feel like an intelligent developer that can do something. And it empowers people to do something without having to install a server, without having to understand all kind of environments, without having to download an SDK and an IDE. Anybody can open a text editor and can start doing cool stuff. And that empowers people. PHP and JavaScript both did the same. Of course, then you talk to the real developers, the ones with beards and like suspenders and stuff, and people who did that for years and years, and they keep saying that it's just not the right thing because it does too many things. Like both PHP and JavaScript can do a lot of tasks, and they will never be as good as things that were built for one task only. So when you compare like HTML5 applications with mobile applications that were natively written for one environment in one resolution and in one mobile phone, they're not going to be as good, which to me warrants a no shit Sherlock award. Because if you build something for one environment, of course it's going to be always better than a thing that's more versatile. If you use a language that was written for iOS on iOS, it's probably going to be better than JavaScript. Really? Because otherwise, why, why should it have been written for the operating system? I always found it interesting, like, I'm probably doing my job right now, but um, I found it interesting when Microsoft was still in the game about, like, we're the fastest browser. And I'm like, yeah, as you hardwire to the operating system, you bloody well should be. Like, if, if the others are faster than you, it's embarrassing. So it, it's always like people want to do the thing, one thing well, and then they look at JavaScript and like, oh, this is not good enough, this is not what we're going to do with it. 
But they have a point, because JavaScript has become much more versatile the way it has been done. We've been doing things in JavaScript that we shouldn't, we weren't even dreaming of in the past, like big data stuff. And we're doing like, I mean, we, we ported the Unreal Engine with SMJS into the browser, so you can do 3D gaming in the browser. That's nuts. That's just mental if you think about it. I use the assembly language on Game Boy Color and PlayStation 1 and these kind of things. I know how hard that stuff is. And in JavaScript, it's just weird that we can do this. So we need to improve the language. I took this picture here from Home Improvement, but it's actually more like, what we do is more like, uh, uh, like Mythbusters. You know, we, we pretend to apply science and then we blow things up. That's what a lot of times we do when we try to reinvent a new language based on JavaScript to replace JavaScript. It's not my favorite, like, Stack Overflow is really good at that when people are like, why isn't Python in the browser? And why didn't you remove JavaScript from the browser and replace it with Dart or something like that? And you're like, dude, this is all over the web right now. There's no way we can actually remove things from it anymore. So a few things that JavaScript did well for a language that was done in 10 years and we should not get rid of, because we want to innovate, are very important and dear to my heart. That's why I worked for Mozilla for a long time as well. Locking people out, to me, is not an option. The success of JavaScript was and is based on its availability on web across browsers. When you had an Internet Explorer 4, you had a drop-down menu that looked cool. That was fine. You didn't have to download a Firefox. You didn't have to download a Chrome. You don't have to download an Opera for, do, for things to do. If you really think you have control over your end users, please leave the web. There's no way you have any control over them. They will do weird things to your code, and I love it, because I have to write paranoid code. I have to write code that expects everything to break, and this is cool code because it will never break, because it already pretended that something will break beforehand. I'm going to go back, it's a bit confusing. But it's the web, it's there. People have a browser, they have a connection, they sit in Timbuktu in some internet cafe in a computer that they, con they don't control. The last thing they want to do after they manage to change their money into something weird and get access to the internet is being told, please download the latest Chrome because we like that. Do not do that to people. The web is there because it's open and standardized and distributed. And when you've been around like me to South America, to Africa, lived in India for a long time, seeing how much power the web gives people, we should never be arrogant enough to tell them that they have to use the same browser that we do, no matter what browser they care I work for. The problem with distributed systems, of course, <laughs> once that something is on the web, it's impossible to remove it. So, I mean, Beyonce here wanted that picture removed. Prince wants to have all his pictures removed. I want to have some of my pictures removed that I uploaded when I was young. Um, well, not young, because I'm not young enough to have pictures on the web when I was young, but fair enough. But you cannot replace JavaScript. It's here to bloody stay. You also cannot force upgrade everybody on every browser on this planet. This is not going to happen. We're going to have a mess of browsers every time out there, and this is cool, because it's users that we reach. It's people that want to have our stuff not buy a new phone, get the functionality, have to buy a new phone half a year later and wait for one year until it's released in Germany to actually get the functionality that they want. In JavaScript, we try to do a few things to make things better. I mean, whenever you talk to Java people and you show them how you can turn a string into a number and then into a float and then into a unicorn and then into a boat, they just go like, what the hell is going on? I want to, I want to have one thing and one thing only. So we have one thing called use strict. Strict mode is a way to opt into a restricted variant of JavaScript. Strict mode isn't just a subset, it intentionally has different semantics from normal code. So putting use strict around them will fire a lot more errors. So you basically put Douglas Crockford in your code just by putting use strict around it. <laughs> and it's an ingenious solution because it's just a string. A string will ever be okay. That there's no problem with that in syntax-wise. The user will the, 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 the JS engine, no matter which one it is, just as a string with a semicolon at the end, fine. The same way you can also copy and paste the URL always in your, in your JavaScript code. Because HTTP colon is actually a label followed by a comment, which is the URL. It's one of my interview questions. People hated me when I interviewed them. <laughs> but it's a really cool way to actually get some functionality into JavaScript without breaking the back of the web, without breaking the, breaking the backwards compatibility. Now, when people get creative, then it gets interesting. There's an article, uh, a blog, uh, blog post, no, it's a blog
blog post. It's a, a post. No, it's a slide deck. Jesus Christ. It's a slide deck by Andreas Rosberg from Google that came out a few days ago that is experimental new directions for JavaScript, where they're trying to actually find new things. He works on V8, he knows his stuff, and I'm not diminishing this, I think it's, it's incredible what they're doing, but they're in inventing new stuff right now. And what they're inventing is Saint script and sound script. Both of them partly based on TypeScript, JavaScript based, so they actually they, they go back to JavaScript in the end. And they do really cool things that are much more like real languages, like much more languages that we need to scale. To get into that, what they came up with is use sanity, which I think is a good thing. Starting with sanity is normally a good thing with any product that you do. <laughs> I, I, I remember Mobile World Congress last year, there was one company, their company slogan was applying thought. You're like, well, I can trust those guys to think about before they do stuff. That's pretty good. And the opt-in is quite interesting, but you can do that further. I mean, say, for example, use the force. <laughs> which would be a version that allows for smooth and exciting 60 frames per second animation by moving things magically around, and it's only for canvas. <laughs> Not saying who's going to use that, but there might be somebody. Use paper and material provided, which is for polymer. Then there's Yosemite which is a, an Apple one that actually randomly does glitch, uh, glitches in your graphical and disconnects your Wi-Fi from time to time. <laughs> There's one to use to excite VCs that is only for specialist version dedicated to IoT and VR, because that's when you want to sell something right now, just do something about Internet of Things. And they're like, what are you using? Things. <laughs> use this bro. There's going to be a version that makes omitting semicolons mandatory and automatically moves op opening braces to the next line and commas to the start of the next line. It's only in the Silicon Valley, so there's a geocache around that, so you cannot use that anywhere else because this only cool startups will be able to do that. But seriously now, um, going back to what I wanted to talk about. This opt-in with the strings was a good idea. It was a good solution for, uh, uh, for strict. Um, I'm not sure if we can actually do that with the rest of them because it still is not a mandatory thing. It's still the rest of the JavaScript still has to be valid JavaScript. It's just, just different rendering like scope around that with that query. When it comes to new functionality, you can always use progressive enhancement. And progressive enhancement is something I fought for for years. And people are always like, oh my god, it's so much harder to do, it's so much work. Progressive enhancement means to jump in the river before you, after you check that it's deep enough. That's how simple progressive enhancement is. It's not about JavaScript being available. It's like having a background color on your CSS and a gradient on your CSS. So if the browser doesn't know a gradient, it will still show a background color and you don't have a, black, a white button with a white text because a WebKit gradient on WebKit was the only thing available to you. It's very simple. Think of escalators. Escalators can never break. If an escalator breaks down, it's, a, it's a, a set of stairs. It's harder to walk, but it's still available to you. Thanks for the convenience. You know, it's like, don't build lifts that when they break, they actually break, and you cannot do anything with them. I love this in my flat in London. Uh, for eight weeks now, they, uh, they have a, a picture in there, and sadly enough to take a picture of it, that said the, um, the alarm is not working. So the alarm button doesn't connect to a, to a person that talks to me. To, to fix that, they put a telephone number in there to call. Which sounds like a good idea. It's graceful degradation, not progressive enhancement. The only problem is no lift has any connectivity. So a telephone number inside a lift when you're stuck is the most insulting thing you can do because I cannot call anybody in that thing. So think about things that work and get better when some functionality is available. That's what, that's what progressive enhancement is about. On the web, the simplest thing was just to test for bits and bobs that the browsers nowadays have. If query selector in document, local storage in window, and add event listener in window, you have a modern browser and you can add the JavaScript functionality. Lazy load the rest of your JavaScript and you're happy. And the Internet Explorer 6 user will never get this stuff. And you don't have to worry if your 6,000 frames animation works in Internet Explorer because it's never going to be shown there. Internet Explorer 6 is an old, old person that has owned its right to be happy with other browsers in a field somewhere and play football. Don't ask them to run around. Don't give them things they don't understand. 
that even gets shorter now. Uh, Jake Archibald found that the other day. Visibility state document return that blocks out everything less than IE 10 and Android WebKit. And I think that's okay. If you have a functional thing that is a web page, an HTML page with a form that sends your data back and gets another view, fair enough. This thing will probably be nicely cached by an Android browser, by a modern one, and look beautiful as well. And the Android browser is a big issue. It doesn't get any security updates anymore. ICS doesn't get any browser updates anymore. So we have a, a whole set of lots and lots of millions of phones out there with old browsers. So that is not a bad idea unless you want to buy all these phones and test on them as well. So it's my favorite people are like, oh, I support i6 because they use jQuery. Do you also test in it? No, then you don't support it. You just assume it. You put magic in there and hope the pixies fix things for you. They don't. They're bastards. They're kind of busy with other stuff. Uh, visibility state and document, modern browser, service worker and navigator, and then you start with service worker, register, and so on and so forth. You got all the cool new stuff. This was the cool thing about progressive announcement. We just did capability testing. We asked the browser, can you do this? Okay, then we give it to you. A simple if statement around our code rather than expecting it. CSS and HTML doesn't need that because it does it naturally. When I put a WebKit gradient in my CSS and the browser doesn't know it, it doesn't do anything with it. It just skips it and goes to the next line. JavaScript is the thing that says, uh, and basically stops. All the other languages are much more faulty. They're totally fine if there's an error in it. They just skip it and go to the next instruction. JavaScript doesn't do that. PHP doesn't do that. And I always find it very funny when people were complaining that XHTML is too hardcore because if there's an error in there, the page doesn't get rendered. But then they make everything dependent on JavaScript. How many things can go wrong in JavaScript? The thing cannot get loaded. There might be an app blocker. There might be a proxy in between. The JavaScript might not be understood by the browser. Don't rely on it, just bask in it, make, make things happy. But the first thing it should be is render something that works and then put your JavaScript in there. The problem now with new JavaScript is that uh, we have no string or capability testing when the syntax changes. And the syntax changed in, in, uh, in, in ECMAScript 6 and ECMAScript 7 and now called ECMAScript 2015 because the jump from 6 to 7 took ages, so they're now calling it every year. So it's going to be a yearly, like, ECMAScript, it's going to be a, like Eurovision, it's going to be a massive party and stuff. <laughs> Go to Stockholm, Eurovision time, it's like you see Swedes called mental, it's amazing. They're really reserved people, but that's really wrong in that time. So we create JavaScript errors by using new JavaScript, because we have new features in ES6 and ES7 that are not valid JavaScript syntax. So the browser that doesn't understand ES6 will say, mm -hmm, and not do anything. Which is I, it's kind of sad because there's cool shit in there. There's some really good stuff in ES6 that is really handy and we need it. And what we would love to have because we invented other things around that in JavaScript already. For example, uh, one of the things, template strings, which I just discovered lately and I started playing with. It's really, really cool. Because uh, a concatenation of strings in JavaScript is terrible. Especially when you have JSLint in your, in your sublime text and you always have trading space after the last plus. You're like, ah, how many times I deleted that one? It's just not fun. The same way I type on click all the time rather than on click, so I wait for that interface to make it work. But with a backtick, instead of, a, uh, instead of a, a single quote or a double quote, I can have line breaks. And the line breaks become part of the string. So they get taken on. And whenever I use a dollar and curly braces, it's a JavaScript that actually gets evaluated and put in there. Might be a security problem in some cases, but it's really, really simple to make a proper templating engine that way that doesn't rely on the HTML template, the element itself. It's basically mustache in the browser now, and it just uses a backtick, which is cool because on French keyboards it means people wait for like six hours to find where that thing is. <laughs> but it, it makes sure you don't have to use the quotes and unquotes and put the pluses in between and all these things. You also realize that I came from PHP because I always use single quotes because in PHP the double quotes would find any dollar and replace it. So it was much slower than the other one. So you can always, it's always quite fun when you see where developers come from to JavaScript in their JavaScript syntax. If you put the comma at the beginning of the line, you're a bastard. Okay. Um, the other one is the arrow functions, which uh, look, uh, every time I looked at that, I'm trying to debug it with SPHP, but it isn't. Um, what that one means is actually that you can, can get rid of the scoping and you, um, 
there's clever ways to explain that. But every time I show something like that to a Java developer or to somebody who comes from Ruby or Python, they're like, what's with all these functions that don't have any name? What's with all these anonymous functions? They just seem so random and they seem so much code to write. And oh my god, my fingers, I don't want to type things. I want to use jQuery instead. Um, what we have in ES6 is these error functions. So instead of having these uh, uh, these anonymous function all the time, the scope is actually fixed much better that way. So I just have an arrow and I can write these things much, much shorter than I can before. Look at those, there's a very interesting thing uh, in terms of what they can do, but you can see already in my sublime text says it's an error. It's a syntax problem, cause the non the JavaScript would say, what the hell is that? You did something wrong. Now, ES6 support the while doesn't look good. Red, in this case, is not good. So, um, we have a problem there because people who want to write in ES6 right now expect the browser to do it. Uh, Spartan, the project Spartan browser engine that I'm working on, uh, is actually one of the best ones right now. Firefox is really good as well. Chrome is getting there. There's ones released every week and it's going to be interesting what's coming up there. If you want to help ES6 being in the browser, and it's only a part of ES6, like uh, these template things are the things that I like as a, as a front-end guy, but there's, there's map reduce, there's filter, there's array functions, there's proper scoping, there's classes, things that you want to have in a language if you don't come from JavaScript directly. The best way to test and help us is actually go to GitHub and the language tests of ES6. These are the ones that every browser maker uses to test if their browser support ES6. So if you help us with these tests, you help every browser to have a good test to test against, which is testing you. The main thing, though, is to, is to understand that a lot of ES6 stuff is things we need for enterprise use cases, for large applications, for people who come from Java and want to go into JavaScript, or come from Ruby and want to go into JavaScript. This used to be Google Web Toolkit, then it was Dart, and now we made it part of the language. It's also something that allows us for memory optimization, like for example, ASM.js was one of those things that allowed us to turn 3D engines into the browser, and JavaScript to become a compile target. A lot of people want to write things, for example, their games in C++ and want to convert it to JavaScript. JavaScript itself, as it stands right now, without the ES6 implementations, is not fun to convert into. So that would make it much, much easier to convert things into. Which is one of the things that Microsoft did some time ago is TypeScript. TypeScript is another language that is written in JavaScript and converts to JavaScript. Which is pretty cool because you can use all the cool things that ES6 has now. Now! You don't have to wait for all the browsers to support it because under the hood, TypeScript converts this into JavaScript itself. Angular 2 is going to use, is going to use TypeScript in it as well. That was announced today as well, first when I saw it earlier on my phone. Because it just works. It's just the kind of language that Java people wanted to have to be JavaScript to be, and we have it right now, and it converts it to JavaScript in the browser if you wanted to. This is one way of doing it. The other way of, way of doing it is, of course, converting it before you send it to the browser, because you probably don't want to do it on runtime. Babel is another JavaScript transpiler. That was used to be called uh, 6 to 5. Um, but now that we renamed it to, to ES 2015, that would be silly because it would be like 2015 to 5, 2014 to so on, on. You have to buy too many domains, it's going to be too expensive. So they just call it Babel. And now that one converts uh, your ES6, ES6, ES7 JavaScript to ES5, which is JavaScript that runs in all the browsers that you would expect it to do. That even has a nice live uh, editor in there where you can see the changes. So if you want to try out some of the new syntax and understand what the syntax means, it gets converted into normal JavaScript on the other side. So you can actually understand what this change meant in the language itself. So by changing the language in a drastic fashion, we are losing some of the interop of JavaScript in the browser. And that's a sad thing because it makes puppies sad and me because I don't want people to have to upgrade their browser and I don't want to cause JavaScript errors by writing better code. That feels weird. And it's not like any other language where in PHP, for example, I had to upgrade my browser and tell the new engine in there, I cannot put another JavaScript engine in the browser because I don't like the one that's in there, especially in other companies that don't have open source browsers. 
And transpiling and converting has become quite a fashion lately anyways. I mean, in the, in the CSS world, a lot of people use SAS instead of CSS. Uh, people think Jade and Tamil and all these kind of things is better than HTML as well because it's new or something, I don't know. But uh, people do this converting anyways. We moved away from just writing things and putting them live into the browser to a world where we have a, a build process that converts things from one to another. So things like Babel and TypeScript and Tracer and all these things we have out there are a good way to actually work with ES6 right now, but not give it to browsers and have lots of unhappy users because it breaks in their computers. Another solution would be to go back to the world of script types, and this is just a crazy idea. I haven't even bounced that off my colleagues yet or anybody who works in JavaScript. It might be completely nuts. But I remember back in the days when Internet Explorer 5 was a thing, and I still have my hair, um, you had text JScript instead of JavaScript, and then you could do all kinds of mental stuff in Internet Explorer 6. You had all these HTAs, which were HTML applications that were full screen, you had full com access. One time I got paid to rewrite Explorer, File Explorer for somebody because they wanted to have their company logo in it. And it was like two months time working and, and writing this thing and every time you went to the uh, resource 32 folder with a blue screen I didn't do anything about it. But you had like really mental stuff in there like W script, create objects, a shell script that gave you a shell pop up with an okay cancel and the information button. Of course, super insecure as well, which they found out the hard way later when lots of people wrote uh, viruses that way. Also, when we didn't have templating, people started using text HTML in a script element because every time the, the HTML parser creates, gets to a script element, realizes it's a, it's, it's a type it doesn't understand, it doesn't render it, it doesn't do anything with it. The same as when you have, say, a MooCal element in the browser, it will not be displayed because the browser doesn't know where it is unless you also write a, a shadow DOM and all kinds of stuff for it. So this was a templating way, so maybe that's an idea considering script type tests ES6 or ES2015, 2014 and so on and so forth. I know it's breaking right now. But I think this is one idea to think about somehow to tell the browser that this is not the way. The, the Flash world has done that for a while as well, like when ActionScript was still a big thing, text ActionScript, I've seen in HTML pages, and it's maybe, maybe one way to solve that problem, but I think transpiling and converting is better, because in essence, as a normal web developer, what ES6 gives me is beautiful, but I don't really need it in most of the cases. Many times we just put far too much JavaScript in our solutions because we like to, and then we wonder why they don't perform, because we didn't architect our solution. We just build things in there, like one widget from one library, and so on and so forth. In any case, I think uh, working with JavaScript never gets boring, and that's why I'm still excited about it. And I've done it for 15 years, something like that, and it's something new every single day, and every time you're like, you just, oh, let's do that, why can't we do that? And like, it failed 15 times already, but that's okay. You do it again, maybe you, you do it this time. We, we get very excited about writing code, but in essence, debugging is what we do most of the time. So when I interview people now, I don't give them code to write, I give them code to debug. I give them code that has errors in them and ask them what's wrong with it and how would they fix these problems, because that's 90% of our job. And I think it's a very, very cool job to have, because the crazy things we can do on the web, I haven't found in any other environment so far. So go and take part in discussions happening right now. I think I want you to be part of this, be part of this test environment. Don't just wait for Google, Microsoft, uh, Mozilla, Apple, uh, Intel, whoever works on these languages to actually come up with the best solution. We built this stuff for you and you should be able to use it without breaking your user's end experience. When a framework goes from one to two or from two to three and all your old solutions become obsolete, then I wonder how useful that framework is and how many of the issues it actually causes. So it's unfair, us who build these things, to make developers work for us because you want to rely on that stuff. I use a framework because I want to rely on it. I use a new functionality in a language because I know browsers do it. So transpiling, using other languages, you have that issue solved somehow. And, well, that's all I have, so thanks very much.